I've yet to find out what an executive producer does. Uh, it's assumed that he uh, essentially runs the show, uh, but that's contested by everybody else involved in the show. Its initial uh, appearance was in the mind of Dan Melnick, who conceived of doing a spoof on James Bond. And Dan and Davis Uskan hired Mel Brooks and Buck Henry to develop it. And I thought they did a remarkable job. Uh, I was intrigued by the original script. However, ABC didn't share mine or the officer's sentiments. Uh, Dan made an egregious error in rebutting them by saying, when we come back with the rewrite, uh, if you don't like it, you can have your money back. And when the rewrite was turned in, they asked for the money back. Uh, that was startling, unprecedented in those days. And it was a, a egregious blow to us. It was the end of the pilot season. All, most shows had been shot. There was nowhere we could shop this script. And uh, uh, we were in the doldrums and feeling bad when N NBC uh, presented a, a lifeline. They uh, had a looking for a property for Don Adams. And uh, we decided that he'd be ideal for this. And of course, that meant the property we have to pitch on the West Coast. Um, the show had been originally written with Tom Post in mind. I don't know if you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. And so it was much more physical than it was verbal. Once we had to consider the possibility of uh, Don Adams being in it, we knew it had to be more verbal and, and reconstruct it slightly. And we didn't yet know whether Don was capable of any physical activity. Um, a third character in New York is important in this story, Dick Dorso. Dick Dorso was the agent representing Get Smart. He had been rejected twice by ABC, and he was un duly nervous and, uh, and overly concerned in my, my mind. Uh, he would call me every day. I was doing a polish on it, and I couldn't really find anything to polish. I thought it was essentially a marvelous script, but we had the two defeats behind us. Um, so each day I'd say, I'm working on it, Dick, and he'd say, please, we're going to have a meeting in a week, and a meeting had been scheduled with Grant Tinker at, uh, of NBC, whom I did not know, and I didn't know Dick. Uh, I was uh, aware of him, but I had never met him. But I had this constant uh, concern uh, pressed upon me each and every day. And I finally, I said, I have an idea for an opening. And I, I, I added a door sequence. Uh, and then I did um, uh, a little bit more, a joke here and there, and I put an agent in a confined space. and. Uh, and each day, Dick would be reassured and uh, for temporarily. And eventually, the meeting was held at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Dick's room. He had flown out here. And Grant Tinker showed up. Uh, uh, and we were sitting in a, a triangle. Uh, we were virtually equal distance from each other. And um, uh, Dick and, 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 and uh, Grant knew each other. And I knew neither of them, but the two men were uh, talking amenities, and I joined in on that. And finally, Grant said, OK, let's get down to why we're here. And he said, I read the script last night, and I read it this morning, and I love it. And Dick said, don't worry, Leonard can fix it. <laughs> so then and there, I realized something is amiss here unless these are two practical jokers. And uh, the more Grant said, uh, lavish and marvelous things about uh, Get Smart, Dick would say, and Leonard's got an idea to change the opening, and he's going to put in a sequence with a, another agent. And I realized Dick was so conditioned. It was Pavlovian. He, he was only hearing def uh, negative thoughts. And if they weren't there, he was making them up. So I decided I better, if surreptitiously, if at all possible, let him know he's on the wrong key, playing in the wrong key. But I couldn't reach him. I couldn't extend my foot far enough. So I gradually s slid down, as I'm doing now, and in my uh, chair until I thought I could reach him. And at that time, I fell out of my chair. And I cl clump on the floor. The both men looked startled. They'd been so preoccupied with their own thoughts. And 
I started to laugh. And they said, what's so funny? I said, you haven't heard each other. And I think I introduced the Maxwell Smart moment into this meeting. And I explained to him that uh, Grant loved the show and Dick only heard uh, uh, dis disclaiming, dis defaming things. And uh, pretty soon we all were able to laugh at it. And that's the history of, uh, of how uh, suddenly Don Adams became Maxwell Smart. I had served in counterintelligence during the war, so I had uh, a, an appreciation of the absurdities uh, that went on in real life, and so capitalized on them in, uh, on, in and on film. My, my experience fortified the moments, gave them a, a, a basis for reality, and, and when anybody said that can't happen, I had irrefutable proof that it could in my mind, so that uh, I withstood many challenges and many attempts to change things. Uh, that they felt was simply uh, uh, impractical or unrealistic or too uh, imaginary. Well, we were very fortunate. There, were, there was a community of writers and actors in New York. It was live television. It was the last gasp of uh, uh, playing before an audience of substantial size, having an opening night every week. It was remarkably rewarding and exhilarating, so it attracted gifted writers, and you had an enormous challenge. You, you, there was no laugh track, thank God. And, and so we benefited from that. We had to earn our laughter, and we were skilled enough to do it or we were gone. And uh, as a consequence, everybody was honed to per perform, as, even when there wasn't an audience, as if there were an audience. Uh, and so the performances always played, even on Get Smart, where we did not have an audience, to an audience. And as a consequence, whenever I took a film and ran it before an audience, we would be fiercely right about the moments that they were going to respond. And uh, we never used a track where we didn't get a laugh from the original uh, audience. But our, our perceptions and uh, uh, guesses were close to 100%. I had had, if I may indulge in this on myself, I had done the, Steve, uh, the Jackie Gleason show in New York for four years, the Bilko show for a year, and Steve Allen for four years. And when I came out here, because the business moved out here, I couldn't get work. Because sitcoms didn't want writers who wrote jokes, they said. But what they went, meant is they didn't want jokes in, in a comedy, which sounds maddened. Uh, because they had actors who couldn't be funny. So it was a bizarre transition and uh, a bewildering. Ultimately, enough of us went back to the, our roots and did shows in front of audiences once again and, and, and survived if, if for ourselves, if not for others, yes. Uh, I had a, a very bright and uh, a likable human being who ran a studio, said to me, Lennon, We'd love you to do a comedy for us, but we don't want jokes. And I, I, I said, you, you don't mean that. He said, yes, I do. And I said, I feel like I'm at the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Why don't you want jokes in a comedy? And he explained, because we don't have anybody who can deliver them. And I said, why? He said, we don't work with comedians. We don't people who've honed their talents. And, and to a certain extent, he was right. So a, a kind, humorous remark that was uh, flirted with uh, uh, a unique twist was satisfactory. And then they had the laugh track uh, was being perfected so that eventually hello became a punchline and left a bewildered audience saying, why didn't I laugh at that? And ultimately, a Pavlovian response 10 years later to laughing at hello. <laughs> Buck is known for his dry wit, biting satire and voracious appetite. That's seldom included in his credits. There is no leftover that Buck won't eat. It was a blessing in the first year to have Buck as the uh, story editor. Uh, we ourselves had great admiration uh, for the current events uh, converting into uh, fine comic material. And, and Buck, as you said, was wry and mischievous. And uh, again, we collaborated on... Uh, uh, a two-part script, 
but it was a fascinating collaboration because uh, literally we talk story. And then Buck would go and do something and leave it on my desk, and I might pick up and add a page or two and, and drop it back at his desk. I don't think we ever talked about the script other than uh, how the story was going to develop. It changed with each year. When Buck was story editor, uh, it was his imprimatur, mainly upon their scripts. But I would work with Buck very closely and hopefully assiduously on story. I felt the story had to be there or get, to get smart w would not succeed. I'm a great believer that essentially you've got to tell a, a well-constructed uh, beginning, middle, and end story, and in that order. Uh, the, um, and once that was there, I, I felt Buck was uh, adroit at, and, and extraordinary gift of dialogue. So we only collaborated in that first year on when he wanted, invited me in or on the scripts we did together. Um, except for, as I said, for story. Uh, the second year, I think Arnie Rosen came in, who was, uh, again, uh, very gifted. I, I remember people I had worked with, uh, Arnie Rosen had been on Bilko. Uh, so and they had this history of uh, marvelous material, so you could trust them. And 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 I didn't believe in there being uh, interfering executives, uh, and I didn't want to be one of them. Uh, and so Arnie. Then the third, fourth, and fifth years, Arnie Sultan was there, and Arnie and I had worked many many collaborations together, starting with uh, uh, Steve, uh, Bill, uh, Steve Allen Show. Uh, so that I always had a very strong a, a producer or story editor involved in the process. And I think uh, Guess Mart was the beneficiary of that. Bill was very good for Don, and Don was good for Bill. They, they had a compatibility and a, a synchronicity that was rare. And as you know, uh, some of the, uh, our... Uh, standard responses on Get Smart with a uh, collab result of a collaboration between Bill and Don. Would you believe is Bill and Don's? And it stood us in good stead through five years. Uh, and that experience Don had working on Bill's film uh, was important because he essentially, was, as you said, and, and no, he was a stand-up comic, but he didn't have much experience working. He's innately a very fine actor and it certainly manifested itself in Get Smart. Uh, so he came to us for Get Smart, ex experienced in getting laughs, and knowledgeable about a three-camera technique, which we essentially employed, even though we were one-camera show, we went for the laugh. We didn't say it's an incidental part of Get Smart. It was the soul of Get Smart to be funny, to be witty, uh, to amuse, you know. Often I hear Maxwell Smart uh, described as bumbling and stupid, and I am very resentful for that because he, he is not that. And if you look at it, only on a badly written show is he that. Occasionally he was. But really he's um, un, an unfathomable character to Chief, but an infallible one. He, he succeeds at everything, and that's important to remember. And so that you say that whatever it is, the preoccupation being self-centered about the issue uh, keeps him from noticing that he's walked into something. But very often he's the victim of, of society or inept uh, uh, structuring of, uh, of a, 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 a chair or a, a, a bench, a couch, a wall. And, and when Maxwell leans on a, a globe, he don't expect it to spin. <laughs> and, uh, but he always recovered. Notice he came up immediately. Max was never deterred by whatever happened to him. That was in the immediate past and forgotten. Barbara was good fortune, uh, blessed with enormous uh, insight on the part of David and Dan. They saw her potential from a commercial. Uh, she was doing a lady, uh, co uh, something with tigers on a rug. And uh, she was very appealing, sensuous, and yet uh, a lady and dignified. Uh, an odd and uh, almost ironic combination. 
and engaging and, and, and enchanting. And we decided to put her under contract, four ninety nine when we hadn't even showed the show. I don't think we'd even finished the script. So Barbara was under contract, and we, the way of paying off a contract, we had a show in New York called Mr. Broadway with starring Craig Stevens. So Barbara played a role in that, from, I think, from time to time, but maybe only once. And uh, uh, we saw that she was indeed at home and acting. And uh, when Get Smart uh, was sold and Don was going to star in it, uh, it was my um, responsibility to introduce him to Barbara on the screen. We thought once he sees her in Mr. Broadway, he'll be most responsive to her. And because she was very good and very effective in this, this program. And as I said, enchanting. Uh, he watched it, the lights went up, and I turned to him for a reaction. And he said, she's taller than Craig Stevens. I, I said, oh my God, I forgot the height problem. And I said, yes, she is. He says, but she's too damn good to let go. <laughs> I love the cast, and the, the majority of the cast were people I worked with before. Uh, the only one I had never worked with uh, was um, Ed Platt. And I had seen Ed Platt in East of Eden and loved him and, and uh, remember waiting for the credits to come on at the end of the film so I'd know his name. And I had an instinct that he would be ideal for the chief. Uh, and uh, I called him in. My only concern was, would Ed be at home in comedy? Could I get that dramatic performance and not uh, boulderize it or prostitute it. I'd want the drama. I want the authority, but I also want him to be aware that there's a comedy going on. And I told him that. And he looked at me a moment thoughtfully, and then he stood up in my office, and suddenly he was singing Old Man River. And I, I didn't know what to make of it. And when he finished, he had a marvelous baritone voice. I realized he had the courage to show that he took this meeting and turned it into a, a performance. And he explained that he had been the vocalist for the Paul uh, Whiteman Orchestra. And I, and I realized that he's at home entertaining. And he picked up what I was saying to him uh, in, in, with, in a roundabout way. And uh, I, I knew I had my chief. Physical comedy is, is a, a dance, a comic dance orchestrated well. Uh, wry wit is best disguised so that the audience only discovers it themselves and becomes fond of it and, and is able to make say this show is distinctively different from others but might not yet explain to you why. Ultimately, they get attuned to it and they start to listen for it. I think that explains why so many of the catchphrases had meaning. They were reflective of the character. They uh, were unique to them, although occasionally the imitations of them, essentially they applied to a situation. Uh, sorry about that, Chief. Uh, was not an intended catchphrase. I don't know if we added it, it was just plain dialogue. But John's distinctive delivery gave it its significance importance and pertinence. And then, so much so that four weeks after the show uh, premiered on the maiden flight to the moon, when something went wrong aboard the spaceship, the astronauts said, sorry about that, Chief, in Don's voice. Astonishing. Which bring, brings to mind, I don't know whether you know, that the only memo I got on the pilot uh, from the uh, network executives, not from broadcast standards, was could I do something uh, to change Don Adams' strident delivery? And had we paid any attention to the memo, we might be not be having this interview. Uh, we had a remarkable good fortune with catchphrases. Uh, as I said, some were intended, some weren't. Uh, and loving it, uh, an intention. Um, uh, the old uh, gun in the banana trick, uh, I think I put in because we had an awkward moment aboard the boat. Uh, we don't shush here. Uh, 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 I was on the set when Bernie was searching for something, and we came up with that. 
We should talk about Bernie. He's another person with whom I had worked in the past and uh, felt uh, uh, privileged to have seen a performance of his in, in Santa Monica Theater where he was immersed in the character to such a degree, I said to Gloria, my wife, we have to go backstage and, and I want to talk to the actor. That was brilliant. And she agreed. She's an actress and she too uh, empathized and understood what he was doing. And when I went back to uh, Bernie Youngman, was playing a, a 20 year old or a 30 year old man with a thick accent and he couldn't get out of the accident. We spoke and he was still in character. And I thought that's remarkable. And I called him the next day to see if he had lost the, the voice finally. And I said, I, I said, someday we'll work together. And, and, it, and it, it happened. Well, it's very interesting. I equate what happened between Maxwell and Siegfried to World War I characters. There was a rapport between the foes. Uh, there was an understanding of it. This was a war was a temporary aberration. They they sought their common kind, uh, people with whom they had a rapport, even though they were on opposite sides. Uh, that may be uh, gilding the lily or a lavish uh, uh, pretense, but I felt it was uh, underpinning of of the, that relationship. He was an aristocratic Nazi, and he never lost the menace without sacrificing the comedy, or the reverse he, uh, would be true. So that that became a meaningful villain for us. And we could explore that character, and it wasn't one-dimensional. If anything, it was four or five-dimensional. So that was very exciting, and uh, uh, a tribute to Bernie's ingenuity. Don was uh, at times testy, uh, but but what what was done was striving for uh, perfection, and as you know, uh, that's un you can't achieve that. So that's slightly unrealistic. But also, Don did not have as good a time as he should have had while he was doing the shows. He didn't. He enjoyed them ultimately. In retrospect, he realized how good they were. But then he was anxious, nervous, and if he didn't want to say anything. Uh, that was too flattering about the show because he might jinx it. You know, the, the fear of all comics, I don't want to put a curse on this, so I'll remain silent for 10 years uh, about it, except to some intimate. You know, they, uh, I think you find classically, uh, when you ask uh, about how the show's going, you, and uh, the comic usually mumbles. Don had a preoccupation with action and uh, uh, a uh, leaned, uh, uh, to my mind, somewhat heavily on violent responses. So I figured the best way to handle this, and, and the way that I did, was let him shoot it, and we'd cut it out later. So, so both of us were satisfied. If you want about 3,000 feet of uh, fights, uh, uh, I can hand it over on the morrow. Barbara's a poetic soul and uh, doesn't live uh, vicariously uh, through her character. And, and Don was, remember, this gave Don five inches of height, uh, muscles that he didn't have, and uh, whatever else uh, one uh, succeeds in having when they convert to macho f uh, philosophy. Uh, but again, he understood it, and he had an objectivity about it once he was removed from the moment. Uh, he didn't pursue it tenaciously and say, we have to do it again and again and again. And then, of course, along the way, he broke his hand. He uh, broke the stuntman's uh, uh, nose uh, so that he had uh, punishing reminders that he wasn't uh, a, a, chore a graceful choreographer of fights. It's a savage uh, editing, I, I consider. It's indifference to the content. And any time the content is minimized, I get infuriated. It bothers me with books today. People aren't interested in what the book is about. It's what, what's the potential bottom line. In bookstores today, if you have a book and you want it displayed favorably on a, on a, on a counter with the uh, title uh, facing up, uh, you pay extra money for that. So it's like product placement in a grocery store or in a film, too. 
It's a subversive to thought. Uh, it's anathema to me uh, what has happened. I think a half hour now is what, 22 minutes or less. That's sad. They're entitled, uh, this is public airways, if I remember correctly, and uh, they're entitled to, I think, three minutes. When there was a code, when the National Association of Broadcasters existed, there was three minutes they could have for commercials. Uh, that's abused now, and the credits are squeezed. There's contempt for the contributors, and that's infuriating. The main title is a great main title. I was inordinately proud of it. I didn't realize it would have the longevity it had. In fact, a, a number of times in the latter years, I uh, said, let's change it, and everybody voted against it. I also, and this is a good example of my um, reflecting on something I had done and wanting to change it 30 years later, I never thought I did justice to the opening shot. I felt I should have handled that better. The camera should have been on the indicator, the dial, until, and stay there until you're firmly convinced it's an elevator before it pulls back and the door is open and he's walking down a staircase. I, I, I just felt that never sold, and if I had another chance, I could do it better. And then the rest was fun, and uh, it, it, that was simply how many, how many doors I had had a personal experience going to report to a, 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 a headquarters that had a labyrinthian setup. So it always stayed in my mind. If I was in a hurry, I might have and had an important message. It would never have arrived in time. And so I, had, I figured, well, every conceivable door, open in, open out, slide up, slide down, and ultimately the phone booth uh, it was seemed to be the perfect destination for for Maxwell. Now here, a memory comes to memory. We were trying to figure out the cost of uh, either digging a hole on the stage, or finding some way to uh, collapse the, the floor and all. And we were talking about it and the estimates were running high. And Don said, what if I just drop to the floor? We said, what? He said, let's try it. And that's what he did. Uh, we built the phone booth up a little to uh, obfuscate or obscure him, and then he dropped to the floor. And <laughs> our effect was accomplished for whatever paint we had to put on the, the cost of whatever paint we had to put on the uh, uh, booth, the lower part of the booth. Get Smart attracted a unique fan base. They were generally erudite, well-informed people uh, with perceptions beyond fandom. Uh, they had a, a, an affection that was uh, palpable. They, they truly, you know, loved the show, weren't living it vicariously, but just the sheer pleasure it brought them was reward enough. And I felt that, I felt that sincerity. And Carl Berkmeyer, who became the president of the fan club, was a, a librarian and uh, is a librarian. and. Uh, s uh, spoke passionately about it and had an understanding of it that uh, uh, I, I, I seriously considered would he have made a writer uh, if, if he were available at those times and days. And I think he would have. He understood the essence. The, he was a quintessential uh, reverent uh, student of the show. And, and, and Sue Kessler was uh, an editor and, and, and responding to it and loving it. And I guess it affected her at a time when she was a young girl that it indelibly etched itself in her memory and as something joyous and good so that she still today is enriched looking at and revisiting memories. You know, I enjoyed them, I think, as, as much as they enjoyed me. And, and, it, and it, it, it led me into a world I normally don't traffic. Uh, or and I, I I've been amply rewarded by the relationships. It's it's not been unilateral. I don't know how to explain the reward. You enter into this. In my high school yearbook, uh, it said gold or objective, and I wrote a pretentious thing looking back at to amuse the world. But here, at least, I, I'm doing part of it. I made somebody feel better, whether it was for 30 minutes or 22, as it now would be. Uh, that's, to me, a tremendous accomplishment and a source of uh, pride.
Permissible pride, yeah. Oh, it's extraordinary when, when you're exposed to uh, people who appreciate it in large numbers. There have been meetings I've attended of, of a number of shows for which I was a writer or participated in, and I found, even with Get Smart, that the audience, the fans, the um, people who uh, dwell in the, in, in the uh, uh, archives of Get Smart, um, they know the show better than I do. They'll ask me questions and I'll look puzzled. They say, no, that was in that episode. <laughs> I say, I'll take your word for it. I don't remember it. I remember uh, we were nominated and exhilarated when we won. Uh, and uh, it, we had, had uh, to be honest, I think we thought we'd win the previous year, which we didn't. So we had been disappointed and we were a little callous and concerned about being too anticipatory. Uh, uh, and when it came, so it was, it was gratification, uh, belated gratification. So, but we felt good about it. And then uh, uh, Buck, uh, I knew would be loquacious and equal to it being a stand-up performer. And so he took over at the microphone. I remember that and said some marvelous thing. And I just said something, I think, uh, that he had taken away what I was about to say. Uh, he had, yeah, uh, anticipated me, uh, I don't remember. But no, those moments are blurs, you realize this. So I only remember that the year before we thought we might win. And this year it was less uh, uh, anticipatory. Uh, we, uh, I think we were prepared that we might not win again. And so it became a, more of a surprise, but at the same time it, it was redemption.